Thank you, Gerard. Uh, I'm going to introduce Nina, uh, Nina Reese. Uh, she is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Asso Alliance for Public Charter Schools, the leading national nonprofit organization committed to advancing the charter school movement. Previously, she was Senior Vice President of um, Strategic Initiatives with Knowledge Universe, a leading global education company with investments in early childhood education, obviously a very important conversation now. Um, before joining Knowledge Universe, Reese also served as Assistant Deputy Secretary for Innovation and Improvement at the United States Department of Education, as a Domestic Policy Advisor to the former Vice President, and as the Senior Education Analyst at the Heritage Foundation. She's appeared on air and in print with a, a variety of national news outlets. She currently serves on the Board of Advisors of the uh, Education Policy and Governance Program at Harvard University, one of our co-sponsors here today and also on the National Association of Charter School Authorizers, as Gerard was just saying a second ago. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you, Jim. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here in Boston. It's not too cold, and, and I'm not going to get stranded. That's always the concern you have when you, you know, come up north in the winter. Um, but like Gerard, I want to really acknowledge the great work that the Pioneer Institute has done over the years. I got to know this institute when I was at the Heritage Foundation in the mid-1990s and uh, have followed their progress ever since. I'm really pleased to be back here today in my current capacity. Um, I also need to mention a few things about Gerard. You know, I, I go back with Gerard for some time now and I really have a lot of respect for individuals who kind of move from the thought leadership role into um, different roles in government and, and, and really stick it out to go from Georgia, you started in California, Georgia, um, Florida, uh, Virginia, and I think, um, I don't know, you're a glutton for punishment perhaps. Um, I don't know if you're going to go back into government, but being able to take the ideas that you that you were espousing as, a, as an advocate into uh, the, the belly of the beast uh, is often not easy, but Gerard has actually been able to not only go into the belly, but also make some significant changes in, in some of the institutions in which he has served. Um, so uh, Boston is also kind of a special place for me. I was um, an advisor to Governor Romney when he was running for president both times. I uh, got to know him um, a bit and um, uh, but one of the things that I really appreciated about his candidacy was the fact that he was from Massachusetts. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why I was excited about his record, and the record of education reform in Massachusetts was really because of everything that the state had done um, from, from the beginning in the area of charter schools. Uh, so you have actually walked that walk between um, freedom and autonomy and accountability in a very measured way. Um, and I think a lot of states are looking at you now uh, in terms of figuring out ways to authorize the right types of charter schools and holding them accountable for achievement since you, you have some of the best charter schools around the country. Um, your law is ranked 11th uh, on a model law ranking report that we produce every year. Uh, I think the only impediment right now to that uh, ranking kind of going up is the fact that you have a cap on your charter schools and uh, facilities finance is not baked into your um, uh, funding allocation for charter schools. And hopefully, uh, you know, with the help of the Pioneer Institute and others, the Massachusetts Charter Schools Association, you will be able to uh, make a change in those two elements and, and hopefully one day rise to the top. Um, Massachusetts, as I mentioned, is the home to some of the best charter schools around the nation. I know we have Savas here. That's, uh, I don't know, are they going to be on the panel? I think they were on the initial list, but that's certainly one of the charters that comes to mind. Um, Match, Excel, Atlantis, and of course you have, um, you have a KIPP charter school here in the state. But what I was struck by in actually reading um, your paper earlier was that uh, in 2011 alone, 20 Massachusetts charters ranked number one in the state uh, on various MCAS tests. 20 out of 75 some odd charter schools in the state. That is. That is pretty remarkable information, information that I'm going to use from now on every time I talk about charter schools. Um, but that's really a testament to the great work that has already happened in the state. And if you can't use this data point to make the case for lifting the cap and replication, I don't know, I don't know what else you can use. Um, we um, are currently working very hard in Mississippi. Uh, to enact a charter school law in that, uh, to, to strengthen a charter school law in that state. Mississippi's law is so weak that they don't even have a charter school in the state yet. 
Um, but I raise this because when, when people look at my background and, and think about charter schools, often they think of chartering as a partisan issue, very conservative and or a Republican issue. But I only need to point to Mississippi and Massachusetts as proof that it is a bipartisan, it has um, uh, bipartisan support. And if you can do it in Massachusetts, then um, you know, it really can't be that, that conservative an, of an issue. Um, so um, as you know, I'm about six months into my role at the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. And I'm entering this space, even though I'm not new to this space, but I'm entering this job um, on the 20th anniversary of the opening of the first charter school in, in um, Minnesota 20 years ago. Uh, great things are happening in our space, uh, and I'm going to touch on some of the progress that we've made over the past 20 years, and then tell you a little bit about what I hope to do uh, to leverage this progress and catapult us to greater growth and quality over the next 20 years. Uh, first and foremost, in the area of growth, we currently have over 6,000 charter schools around the country uh, in 42 states, uh, and in Washington, D.C., it's actually 40 states in D.C., since two of the other states don't have a charter yet. Um, and, and charter schools serve roughly 2.3 million students in these schools. But at the same time, we have 610,000 students on waiting lists to attend charter schools. Here in Massachusetts, you have roughly 45,000 students on a wait list to attend a charter school. Charter schools are still fairly small in size. We're only about 5% of the market, if you look at kind of the national picture. But our impact is being felt um, in a lot of the cities around the country in a pretty meaningful way. In fact, this last fall, uh, we discovered that for the first time in over 100 communities, at least 10% of the student population was attending a charter school, Boston being one of them. Uh, the concentrations are most felt in uh, areas like New Orleans, where over 70% of the student population is attending a charter school. Uh, but that was also thanks to a law that was enacted after Hurricane Katrina. But in places like Washington, D.C., where they don't have a cap, over 40% of the students are now attending charter schools. And the conversation in D.C. now is very much along the lines of, well, how, how far can this number grow? How much is enough? You know, at what point do you put a moratorium and say, no more charter schools can be created in, in, in the district. Um, the other thing that's interesting about Boston is that between 2010 and 2011 and the 2011-2012 school year, you had a 20% increase in enrollment in charter schools. Uh, so as you see more and more concentrations of charter schools in certain jurisdiction, you should also be able to see the impact of chartering on the greater uh, public school system, hopefully for the better. Uh, from a polling standpoint, polls uh, continuously show that there is a lot of public support for charter schools among those who certainly understand what they are. Uh, but there's also a lot of confusion that the, the percentage of people who are undecided or don't know what a charter school is, is actually very high. Um, I was with a group of stakeholders in Washington, D.C. when I first started this job in August. And um, someone made the observation that he didn't think that a lot of the teachers in charter schools even knew what the difference was between a charter school and a uh, traditional public school system. So we have a lot of work to do to educate people about what charters are and why they're different and why they're, why, why they're special. Uh, the politics of chartering. I mentioned earlier about highlighting Massachusetts and Mississippi as examples that the issue crosses party lines. Um, but when I first started working on this issue, President Clinton was actually running, Governor Clinton at the time was running for president. And um, he uh, was speaking at the KIPP summit last summer and he mentioned how every time he would be on the campaign trail talking about education reform, he would mention charter schools and his advisors would get really mad at him because they were like, you know, no one knows what a charter school is. Even if they did, there's just one of them right now in Minnesota. Why do you keep talking about this issue? Um, so it's very, you know, as, as you all know about President Clinton, I mean, I think he was at the forefront and understood really the power of this reform in bringing both sides of the aisle together. And that bipartisanship certainly has lasted over the years in Washington. So much so that the only legislation that was able to get enacted in the last Congress with, with broad bipartisan support on the education reform front in the House of Representatives, where you can't bring the parties together to agree on anything, was a charter school bill. 
uh, and we hope to leverage that in the, in the coming years. Uh, research. Um, you know, when I was at the U.S. Department of Education, uh, I oversaw 28 grants that supported 1,700 projects. Um, and every so often, I'd have the lobbyists of one of the programs in my office to tell me well, how great this program was, what a great job it was doing. And most often, these, ent these individuals would come to me with a number of anecdotes, uh, numbers of individuals who were benefiting from the program, um, and that was it. They never came in to see me with any kind of research. And um, what's interesting about charter schools is that not only do we have the human interest stories and the waiting lists to demonstrate that there is demand, but on top of that, we also have a lot of research about its effectiveness. In fact, we have over 200 studies of charter schools um, and, and more coming down the pike. There was just one yesterday that came out of Credo, which is a research institution associated with Stanford University, which again showed that the progress of charter schools in New York uh, were, were so great that they were outperforming their counterparts in the traditional public school system. So this research is kind of all over the map, but what they have in common, certainly what the high quality ones have in common, is that when, when you do controlled kind of randomized field tests, the students in charter schools tend to do better, especially those students who are attending inner city public charter schools. Uh, and it's something that we should celebrate and we should always kind of have in the back of our minds when we talk about charter schools. Uh, but if this is not enough to convince people that charters um, are the right kind of reform, if you look at the different rankings that have been done over the past few years, charters are just about, again, 5% of the market, but they comprise 17% of the U.S. News and World Report's uh, best high schools list, and there are 60% of Newsweek's transforming high schools list. So again, um, pretty, pretty impressive numbers. Here in Massachusetts, since you're able to participate in the, in the TUDA, uh, charter schools uh, have been able, to, we've been able to see that the charter schools outperform uh, traditional public schools on the NAEP test uh, in the eighth grade, a proficiency test in math and reading. Uh, so again, pretty, pretty impressive numbers in Massachusetts and nationally. Um, so what do we do with, with all this information? Where do we go from here? Um, uh, one of the first things that I was asked to do when I started working at the Alliance was to revamp our strategic plan, uh, something that I was really excited about at first. And if you ask me now, I'm like, that was probably the most tedious exercise. This is Jenny, who's one of my colleagues, can attest. I'm glad it's almost over, but um, one of the things we decided to do uh, in the strategic planning process is to really focus on three areas at the same time that we're trying to grow the movement. Uh, there are three areas that we're really going to hone in on and emphasize over the next, uh, over the next five to ten years. One is quality. Um, so quality is one of those issues that comes up a lot when you talk about charter schools, um, and uh, most of the discussions tend to be around um, shutting down poor performing charter schools. And we are very much in favor of that. If a charter school is not performing well, it is not doing the students in that system uh, any good, and it's also not giving our sector a good name. So we are all in favor of shutting down charter schools that are not performing well. But at the same time, the medium in which charter schools are housed uh, are just as important as you know, honing in on the poor performing ones. Because in my opinion, you know, charter schools are not a monolith. Uh, depending on the laws that have enacted them, the authorizers that are approving them, uh, how well those laws are being implemented by the regulators that oversee the law, how much poor pupil funding is following students to charter schools, whether they have access to facilities, what types of teachers they can attract, all of these factors lead to whether you can actually run a charter school in a state. So acting as if quality is kind of, can happen just about anywhere so long as you have a charter is one of those myths that we have to dispel. And our role at the national level is to really push and catapult, kind of create the medium in which quality chartering can, uh, can grow. Um, as a point of reference, you know, I used to work um, up until August at a child care company, actually CCLC, which is across the street, was one of the companies that we ran. This company sat in the, squarely in the private space. In fact, my job uh, in government relations was to make sure I kept the hands of government as far as possible from this company as I possibly could. So when you, when you think about scaling in, you know, in the private sector, it's all about doing the same thing in the same way without compromising quality. 
So again, in the private sector, you have the audience you have to cater to are the families that you serve. So they have a lot of other regulatory issues that they have to deal with, but at the end of the day, I would argue it's far simpler for them to be able to scale and talk about quality and be treated as a brand as it is for charter schools that, again, are living in this kind of space where, depending again on where you are, how you're being operated, how, how much money is following you, you're going to have a very, very different situation. So getting the laws right, making sure that every state has a high quality law that ranks high on our model law ranking report is going to be very important to us. Uh, weak laws and the weak implementation of strong laws uh, are probably the greatest impediment to quality growth for charter schools. So at the same time that we're going to shut down the poor performing charters, we're going to be adamant about making sure that the new charters that are coming on the, on the scene are of high quality uh, and that we are uh, replicating those successful programs at a rapid clip. Uh, the second area that uh, we're going to focus on is innovation. Um, you know, everyone knows that chartering was kind of uh, premised on the notion that if you gave um, innovators and entrepreneurs greater freedoms and autonomy, they'd be able to produce greater results. But kind of in that discussion, one of the things that we always wanted to see happen is a greater degree of research and development in charter schools. Um, so again, our job at the national level is to make sure we're keeping kind of the hands of government as far away from, from intruding on this innovation as possible. Uh, but a lot of these rules and regulations are at the state and local level. Uh, so I, again, I'm, I look forward to working with the Pioneer Institute and other entities to really kind of figure out what is getting in the way of innovating in charter schools. Is it the individuals in the system who may think they can't do something but in fact have the flexibility to do that? Or is it a specific rule and regulation? And if it is a specific rule, how can you circumvent it? How can you fight against it? Uh, or, you know, since the Secretary of Education loves waivers, is there a way for us to partner with the State Department of Ed here to ask for a specific waiver, to let charters do some things differently, maybe opt out of Common Core? Where's Jamie? There you go. Um, to, uh, to, to see if they can do something different in exchange for raising student achievement, using a separate set of standards, perhaps. So, uh, pushing the envelope on innovation in, in kind of a measured and calculated way is going to be one of the other areas that we're going to focus on. Um, and then the last piece, and probably the most important piece, is this question of equity. Making sure that charters can tap into the same amount of funding that follows students to traditional public schools. Uh, according to national <coughs> research, we know that charters <coughs> receive only about 75 cents of every dollar that follows students to <coughs> traditional public schools. Uh, this is the charters in inner city settings, and the numbers are going to vary depending on the state that you're in. Um, we need to address this equity issue, not because it's, it's, it's an important issue from a dollar standpoint for our sector, but here's where I think the charter space can actually contribute a great deal to the greater discussion about education reform, which is that funding ought to follow children, regardless of the district in which they live, uh, and regardless really of the state that they live, that, that funding amount should not be so uh, different depending on where you live and the conditions under which you were born. So pushing the envelope on weight student funding and increasing that funding to an amount that everyone agrees is the bare minimum that children ought to get uh, is going to be very important to both the health of the sector and the health of uh, the public education um, system. Um, so um, with that, I hope uh, that you will um, visit a great charter school if you haven't visited one yet. Uh, I hope that you will push your legislature to lift the cap on charter schools in Massachusetts so that you can continue doing the great things that you have already done in this state. Um, that I also ask that you help educate your members of Congress about the benefits of charter schools. You have uh, quite a few new members who, um, uh, who, you know, who are in Washington now and we we're eager to work with them uh, to help increase the amount of money that the federal government makes available for charter schools at the state level. Uh, and I, um, I hope that you will join us, actually, in Washington, D.C. in July. Um, my colleague, Jenny Wanger, uh, is in charge of our National Charter School Conference, which uh, happens to be in D.C. this year. Uh, it attracts over 4,000 uh, charter school leaders from across the nation, and it's kind of the one gathering for everyone in the room, from the leaders to the teachers to the policymakers. Um, 
And um, I really hope you will be able to join us this summer um, to, to continue this discussion. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you.